Hello my friends, in this video we'll be taking a look at the autosomal DNA results, predicted phenotype traits and uh, G25 results of a 6th century, actually 7th century Saxon uh, female from the, from the east of England, from Kent. And essentially let's get into the results. First we're going to look at the G25 results of this individual, EAS001. With G25 she is closest to Dutch and French people from Brittany, followed by Welsh, and finally English from Cornwall. So it looks like she's actually closest to various Celtic peoples, rather than Germanic English, which is quite interesting. Uh, if we look at the population breakdown, she's getting more as a mixture of English from Cornwall, plus Shetlandic, plus Italians. So it seems that she's quite Southern, actually, in terms of her admixtures. And it makes sense that she's so close to Dutch and French from Brittany and Welsh, and English from Cornwall, rather than uh, to Germanic, more Germanic admix populations from the British Islands because of her southern admixture, uh, because of her high amount of European farmer and uh, low amount of Western hunter-gatherer and steppe admixtures. What's also surprising and a little bit interesting is that she's scoring 1.6% Papuan and a little bit of Dolgan in this admixture. I'm guessing this is just, uh, you know, noise. With G25, I don't think she really has any kind of uh, South Eurasian or East Eurasian admixture in reality. But it's also kind of interesting that she scores that with this G G25 model. It's a very high quality sample, by the way. The coverage is 84%. So it's one of the really high quality samples that I can show you with uh, Trade Predictor. And uh, let's get into her results with Trade Predictor. So we're going to start with the Shakot calculator results. Uh, really excited to show you that. So with the Nashakot calculator, she definitely has blue eyes. Uh, the likelihood of blue eyes for her is 47.9%. So it's a really high percentage to score. So she most likely has blue eyes. Although the likelihood for blue eyes with a neighbor center or green eyes is also quite high. If you add them up together, uh, that's going to add up to 43%. So actually 44% if you consider the, um, if you consider the decimals after the decimal point. But uh, altogether, that's 44% for green or, or blue eyes with a neighbor center versus 48% for blue eyes. So most likely she has blue eyes. There is a pretty insignificant likelihood for hazel eyes as well and absolutely 0% odds for brown or dark brown eyes. So she most likely has quite light eye color. For hair color likelihood distribution, it looks like she has predicted, predicted hair color that is light brown. Uh, there is a pretty fair... Uh, there's a pretty significant likelihood for dark blonde hair as well. At 24% likelihood, there is a pretty significant likelihood for dark brown hair at 23% likelihood. And there is actually even a pretty significant likelihood for light blonde hair at 4.8% likelihood. But mostly, most likely her hair color is somewhere between dark blonde and dark brown. I'd say in terms of phenotype, this is a pretty typical English phenotype. So hair color that is somewhere between dark blonde and dark brown. Uh, the majority of English and British and even North, North, the Northern uh, French people fall somewhere in this range. Uh, blue eyes is, I would say, on the lighter side for this type of uh, ethnicity. Uh, I would say especially for Northern French, blue eyes is definitely on the lighter side. But for English people, it's quite common. Uh, for skin color, she is scoring most likely white color skin. And there is also a 19% chance for palest skin. So she, she's also very white in terms of skin color as well. So she's very light in terms of pigmentation. And for hair texture, she is scoring most likely wavy, uh, wavy hair texture. Although there is also pretty significant likelihood of straight hair and curly hair. She's scoring 27% for straight hair, 19% for curly hair, and 53% for wavy uh, wavy hair texture and there is pretty much zero percent odds for kinky hair so she does not have kinky hair and the higher quality your genome file is the more precise this hair texture prediction is going to be uh, it's very important that i drill that i instill this uh, understanding into you guys so with um sometimes you have these predictions where it's not exactly precise and that's because most most times that is because the file quality isn't very high uh, in this case, this is a very high quality file. So here, the predictions, especially predictions that are that rely on a very large number of SNPs, such as the hair texture prediction, it is very, very high quality. It's a very good prediction. 
for nose shape, she's scoring most likely snub shape nose. Very interesting. So she's predisposed to, I guess, more shorter, more upturned nose shape. And for coloring related variants, looks like she has blue hypotype 2, blue hypotype 1. And what's interesting is she does she has heterozygous gene type here, which I, I guess there's a little bit of a dislinkage here that occurred between uh, her genotype in uh, all of these variations and here and her genotype here. So usually with this type of genotype having BH2 and, and 1, you are also going to inherit two light color variants in this variation as well, but she only inherited one light color variant here. But it doesn't matter all that much. It doesn't contribute to eye color in a very significant way. It's just a slight contribution. But if she had two light color variants here, her prediction for eye color would be even more uh, it, would, it would be even more extremely blue than it is right now. Uh, she has two light color variants in all of the relevant variations for um, pigmentation in SLC 45A2 and SLC 24A5. Really good to see. So she's very light pig pigmented. She does not have the European hunter gatherer blue eye, uh, red hair, and pale skin variants in IRF4. And she has actually she has one light color variant in MC1R, so she is a little bit predisposed to ginger hair in MC1R. And we do find some variations where she has uh, unidentified genotypes. So we, we do have some un, un, ungenotyped variations in her file. So even though this is quite a high quality genome, and uh, there's a lot of variations that, even though this is a very high quality genome where there is a lot of information present. There are still a lot of genotypes that are not present in the file. Like if you count them up, that's one, that's two. That's actually quite important. So there is no genotype for blue hypotype three. That's quite important. If we had this genotype in the file, we would have much more insight into her coloring. But we don't have this genotype in the file, unfortunately. Despite the file being so high quality, some information is still lacking from it. That's two, that's three, that's four. Uh, that is right here, that is five, that is six. That is seven. Seven missing genotypes is not that much, to be honest. But it's seven out of something like 74 or 75. So really, the ratio of present genotypes to absent genotypes in this file is really, really astronomically high. Much higher than most of the genotypes I analyze. Much, much higher than most of the genomes I analyze on this channel. Let's look at the phenotype oracle prediction for this individual. And see what phenotypes match closest to this a uh, Saxon woman from the seventh century. So the closest phenotypes to her is this, um, which I guess makes sense. This is how I do imagine Saxons to look like, followed by this, which also is how I imagine Saxons to look like, followed by this, which is definitely not how I imagine Saxons to look like. This looks more like, I would say, Kwame or Karelian. And for the mixture of phenotypes, let's look at the mixture of phenotypes for the phenotype oracle. The closest mixture is a mixture of 50% this, which I guess would be like um, British plus 50% Komi. The second closest mixture is a mixture of 50% Komi plus 50%, I guess, English or British. The third closest mixture is a mixture of English plus British plus English or British. Then Komi plus English or British. Then uh, this, which is like really, really exotic. Um, not even Komi. This is not even European in my opinion. This is more like, I guess it looks like Chechen or or some kind of um, Northern Caucasus, plus English or British. I know it's called North Indid. Like if you look this genotype phenotype up, it's gonna say North Indid, but it doesn't look. It does not really look Indian. It looks more Northern Caucasus to me. But uh, essentially, this really exotic uh, phenotype plus English or British. So the reason that this individual is scoring these exotic non-European phenotypes in the Oracle, uh, you can actually find that out by just looking at the stuff that's in this file. So let's look up the facial morphology, facial morphology panel, and we're going to look at the stuff that's in this file, and we're going to find out why she is scoring the way she is. And it's going to be in the, in the very first three, uh, in the very first three lines. Actually, you can find that out. So here we see um, European genotype in EDAR. And the very next line, we see one European EDAR allele is likely partially European. So this this line right here is the reason she's scoring these. Um, exotic phenotypes in the facial morphology oracle because of this genotype right here. If she did not have this one exotic EDAR allele that is exotic for Europeans, she would not be scoring these exotic phenotypes for the facial morphology oracle because the facial morphology oracle is based on 
uh, alleles that have to do with with facial morphology, and they are they are they are not all here. There is some other alleles that are not um, displayed on on the uh, screen, but the most important alleles, the alleles that play the biggest impact, are all here on the screen. And uh, it's actually her genotype is actually not even all that like it's not even all all that um, exotic, right? Out of the three EZAR variations, which means six alleles, she only has one exotic one exotic allele. So that's five typical European alleles out of six. But that one exotic EZAR allele is what makes her score these exotic uh, Volgid or you know Komi like phenotypes in the facial morphology oracle. It does play a big role. Um, okay, she has a genotype for smaller nose size. Uh, nose drooping down, likely lower odds of missing teeth, two genotypes for thicker eyebrows, really cool, and uh, intermediate odds of protruding nasal bridge, and longer mid-face length, pretty cool. Okay, now let's check what she scores for the biomarkers results, for the biomarkers panel. So she's scoring above average levels of vitamin D, really good to see. Below average levels of LDL cholesterol, really good to see. Also below average levels of HDL cholesterol, which is not so good, but uh, below average levels of LDL cholesterol, which is really good. That's really good to see. Above average levels of glucose, which is bad. Below average levels of hemoglobin, which is really rare. I don't see that very often, but that is also good. Uh, below average blood pressure, which is good. Below average level of iron in the blood, so she does not have any hemochromatosis variants, does not have the Celtic curse, really good to see. Uh, above average level of sex hormone binding globulin, really good to see. Below average level of red blood cell count in blood. Spot on average number of base pairs for telomere length, so she uh, has spot on average um, predisposition to lifespan. And way below average height, so she's predisposed to be a little bit shorter than average in terms of height. Let's look at her polygenic risk scores, predispositions to certain conditions. We're going to ignore uh, risk scores that are close to one, and we're only, we're only going to look at risk scores that are um, very distant from one. So she has very low odds for arrhythmia and nodosum. She has very high odds for hemoglobin E disease, which is really, really interesting. This is actually thumbnail worthy, in my opinion. Because this is a this is a very high score, so this is something we have to keep in mind. She has a very high predisposition to hemoglobin E disease. Very interesting. I don't see that very often, actually. She has a very low score for gout. She has a high score for thyroid cancer. She has a low score for eczema. She has a low score for exfoliation glaucoma. She has a high score for primary congenital glaucoma. She has a low score for polycystic ovary syndrome. Good for her. Uh, it's actually quite relevant because she's a female, so low score for polycystic ovary syndrome is definitely good for her. Low score for cataracts. I will above average score for age-related macular degeneration. Below average score for Tourette's. High score for epilepsy. Above average score for asthma. Above average score for leukemia. Below average score for vitiligo. Below average score for myopia. Below average score for corneal astigmatism. Um... Above average score for male pattern hair loss, which is kind of typical for Europeans to score above average for that. So there's nothing surprising about this. Uh, below average score for atrial fibrillation, pretty good to see. Uh, average, spot on average score for ADHD, spot on average score for deep vein thrombosis, spot on average score for unipolar depression, but a very low score for bipolar type 1. So she's quite protected from bipolar type 1 and very low score for schizophrenia. Really good to see. So she's quite protected from bipolar type 1 and schizophrenia. The scores for bipolar type 1 and schizophrenia are connected together. So uh, if you score one, lower for one, you're probably going to score lower for the other. Um, she's scoring average for type 2 diabetes and average for type 1 diabetes. She's scoring lower for Alzheimer's and she's scoring lower for multiple sclerosis. Really good to see. So for breast cancer, she's got three risk guidance out of 16. And uh, that's pretty interesting, pretty common. 14 risk variants for testicular cancer of 20. That's really high. And she actually has all the, all the homozygous genotypes in keto G that are relevant to risk for testicular cancer. So she's quite cooked when it comes to keto G genotypes for testicular cancer. But really, uh, once again, she's a female. So that, that is not relevant for her because females don't have testicles. So, you know, good for her. 
For Select Disease, she's got four risk gradients out of eight. Pretty typical. Uh, for GSS, no risk gradients. Really good to see. Crohn disease. Uh, she does have two important risk gradients for Crohn's. So that's quite. She's quite cooked when it comes to Crohn disease. Uh, she's probably she she's pretty supposed to Crohn's disease actually. Let's look that up. Hold on. Let me look that up in the file. Can I find that? Wait. Let's look up Crohn's. Yes. Okay. Yes, we found that. Uh, significantly or two times higher risk of Crohn's disease. Yes, we did. We did find this um, genotype in the file. So um, that's quite uh, that's quite dangerous that she has this genotype for Crohn's disease. Okay, uh, so she is predisposed to Crohn's because of because of this genotype. So yeah, there is some predisposition to Crohn's. No risk for Raffensteins. Uh, one risk for Parkinson's. So she's she's predisposed to Parkinson's as well. Uh, no uncommon risk for Gilberts, no, no risk for basal cell carcinoma or anything else here. Yeah, I don't see anything else here. I don't see any uncommon risk gradients here. I do see one uncommon risk gradient for familiar aortic aneurysm, but this is not a heterozygous. This is the heterozygous genotype, so most likely this is a miscall. We can disregard this. And leave from any one risk gradient here, but this is also heterozygous genotype, so we can disregard this as well. The reason I'm not disregarding the genotype for Crohn's, and let's scroll back here, is because this is a uh, homozygous genotype. When it comes to homozygous genotypes, usually homozygous genotypes are not missed calls. So, in this, in, in terms of this, this is a legitimate genotype that she has that predisposes her to Crohn's disease. Really, really unfortunate. So, what can we take away from this? We, we can take away from that that she's predisposed to Crohn's. Um, we can take away that she's predisposed to testicular cancer. Uh, she's predisposed to hemoglobin E disease. Um, what else? What else is she predisposed to? Parkinson's. And uh, she's really protected from schizophrenia and bipolar. That's what we can take away from this result. Let's go ahead and look through the immunogenic traits and see what we determine here. So for uh, what are your versus what are your? She's definitely more of a what are your, uh, which is really atypical for Europeans. Um, Europeans tend to be more what are your, but um, if you take into account her genotype in Compt, MAOA, and MO MAOB, she's definitely much more of a what are your, um, definitely much more of a client towards what are your phenotype. In case you don't know what what are your versus what are your means, essentially what are your phenotype is uh, when you have higher activity of the Compt and MAOA enzymes. Um, quicker dopamine breakdown, therefore lower dopamine levels at all times, and therefore you have um, lower ability to motivate yourself and uh, pay attention in low stress conditions. However, when the when the stressful, when you are placed in a stressful environment and your dopamine production is naturally higher because of that, you are able to function um, at a better, you're a bit able to function and perform better than people who naturally have a Woody Yer phenotype, who naturally have higher, low, higher dopamine levels at all times, but in a stressful condition, they aren't able to function as well because they have dopamine overload. Unlike you, who are a warrior, who hits the optimal dopamine level at a stressful condition, in a stressful condition, in a stressful environment. So the, the description is right here. Quick dopamine reuptake, low dopamine levels, and high stress resiliency, whereas warrior is a slower dopamine reuptake and higher dopamine levels and lower stress resiliency. So this individual definitely has lower dopamine levels and high stress resiliency. And also, this is not a very European phenotype to have. For DRD2, uh, she has a predisposition to low, lower, uh, lesser amount of dopamine D2 receptor sites in the brain. Uh, this also contributed to her score for schizophrenia and bipolar. Uh, we remember she was scoring very low for those. So uh, this, um, this result contributed to that. It's not a very big contribution, but it is a contribution nonetheless. And... Um, Less D2 dopamine receptors does contribute to a decrease in the risk of conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar. Uh, it also uh, leads to an increase in the odds of you being a no-go learner in certain other behavioral traits. Uh, when it comes to her levels of 5-HT and serotonin, it looks like she has a predisposition to lower or intermediate levels of 5-HT and serotonin, which leads to an increase in the conditions such as anxiety and depression. Actually, let's look that up in her... Uh, polygenic risk scores. What was she scoring for depression? 
she was scoring average for depression. And I don't have an anxiety risk score, but anxiety would be higher than average because of this this result. Uh, she's not a dwarf. Um, she has a gene type for lower risk of behavioral disorder. Okay. When it comes to autism, she has a predisposition to lower odds of autism. Really good to see. So she's a little bit protected from autism. And for lactose persistence, she has a predisposition to higher odds, higher or intermediate odds of lactose intolerance. So what's interesting is, as you can see here, uh, out of these four genotypes, out of these four variations, she does not have a single allele for lactose persistence. Not here, not here, not here, not here. Out of these eight variations, out of these eight variants, she has not a single variant for lactose persistence. And yet she is only scoring 50% for higher odds of lactose intolerance. That is because of the way I built my tool. The way I built my tool, especially when it comes to the lactose persistence panel, is that the highest you can score for, for, for lactose intolerance is 50%. You cannot score higher. This is the highest percentage you can score for lactose, lactose intolerance. Literally, you cannot score any higher than this. Uh, and uh, I, I built this this way because I kept in mind that most people in the world are not lactose intolerant and most people in the world do not have the European lactose persistence mutations. So she does not have any of the lactose persistence mutations, it looks like. And she is essentially scoring, uh, she's essentially scoring the score that is, that, that is the highest you can score for lactose intolerance with my tool. Uh, for OXTR and empathy gene, she is scoring lower levels of empathy, lower or average levels of empathy based on these four SNPs. Okay. Uh, for diabetes, remember she's scoring average for both type 1 and type 2. Hemochromatosis, she does not carry any risk clearance for hemochromatosis. Alzheimer's, no risk clearance for Alzheimer's in APOE. Uh, multiple sclerosis, looks like no risk clearance for multiple sclerosis in the HLA gene. Really good to see. Cardiovascular disease panel, looks like she has a predisposition to, uh, it looks like intermediate odds of cardiovascular issues. Really good to see. So, uh, if you take all of this panel into account, her predisposition is to intermediate odds of cardiovascular issues. Okay. Uh, this we already looked at. For vitiligo panel, she actually does have one risk variant for vitiligo in the HLA gene. So, but all, overall, keeping everything in mind, we are going to see really good results in the HLA panel. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit here. HLA panel is the panel dedicated to the HLA gene that I built in my tool. Um, so the HLA gene is the human leukocyte antigen gene that has to do with uh, the immune system and is responsible for various autoimmune disorders in humans. And uh, the HLA gene is a very, very large, it is one of the biggest genes in the human genome. And um, I built a panel for it that analyzes all of the variations in the human leukocyte antigen gene. And uh, we're going to look at the, the panel, the HLA gene panel a little bit later in this video. So for a miscellaneous section, no micropenis, no micropenis here either. Uh, she's got a genotype for impaired muscle performance, likely endurance athlete rather than strength for power athlete. Really good to see. And um, she has a genotype for average brain volume. She's not an Asian flusher, which is not so surprising, right? I mean, not so surprising. She's not an East Asian. So obviously, why would she be an Asian flusher? Uh, let's see what else can we see. She's got greater odds of cannabis-induced psychosis, which is not a very European genotype to have. Europeans tend to have, statistically speaking, Europeans tend to have TT in this variation, which leads to uh, some protections from cannabis-induced psychosis. But in her case, she's got greater odds of cannabis-induced psychosis. Um, okay, she's not an albino. She doesn't have any variants for albinism. She also is not a carrier of Melanesian blonde hair variants. For... Familiar Mediterranean fever variants, she does not carry any risk variants for familiar Mediterranean fever. For MTHFR panel, she's got uh, genotypes for normal homocysteine levels. She's got a genotype for uh, somewhat higher odds of neural tube, tube defects, which is very interesting. But I don't think that affects the homocysteine panel. I don't remember, but I don't think that affects the homocysteine panel. And another genotype that's, that's uncommon that leads to slow, slightly lower blood pressure. Once again, I don't think that affects the homocysteine panel but I don't remember. Uh, for alcoholism, she's got below average odds for alcoholism. Really good to see. And for cancer's panel, she's got uh, these genotypes for uh, increased risk of testicular cancer. So yeah, she's, she's really cooked. Uh, we already discussed this. This is all on the testicular cancer panel in the polygenic risk scores page, but we already dis discussed this and she's really cooked when it comes to that. Uh, for leukemia panel, 
So she she is quite cooked for leukemia, but for leukemia, the most important variations is this, uh, and and she doesn't have any risk variants here. But um, yeah, let's look at the rare diseases and traits panel. Let's look at what uh, she has here. She's not a carrier of hemo hemophilia B mutation, really good to see. But what, what is she a carrier? She's got strong predisposition to hemoglobin E disease. We already discussed this, and this is not a missed call. This, this is not a missed call or a genotyping error because it's a hom homozygous genotype, and it's also quite common. Uh, she's a carrier variant for hyperkeratinomia and vitamin E deficiency. Wow. A lot of really uncommon stuff here. Um, she's. Let's see what else. She's a Finnish major solid disease mutation carrier. This I would attribute to uh, missed calls. I think this is a missed call because this is a very uncommon genotype to have. And uh, there is just a lot of really uncommon heterozygous genotypes for various conditions, such as we remember Parkinson's, uh, familiar aortic uh, aneurysm, stuff like that. And it's really. It's really uncommon to have these these rare mutations, right? Especially like five of them in the same file. So so I'm inclined to believe this is a missed call. Okay, what else? Some of these, especially the heterozygous variations, are really are usually missed calls, but homozygous ones are not. And that's pretty much it. Okay, celiac disease, no risk variance in the HLA gene. Um. Androgen receptor gene panel. This is very interesting. So she has AG here, which leads to a decreased risk of boldness, and A is the protective allele. The reason this is so uncommon, and it is uncommon, is that most Europeans, almost all Europeans have GG here. And the A allele here is actually reserved to African, uh, essentially just African nations and people of African descent. And it's so surprising that she, without having any African ancestry, has the A allele here. So this definitely reduces her odds of boldness by quite a lot but despite this she is scoring um despite having the allele here she is scoring something like 1.5 percent i think 1.5 times the average odds for boldness i don't remember let's let's hold on i think it was 1.5 i think it was 1.5 hair yeah 1.59 so she's scoring 1.6 times the average odds for for male pattern hair loss uh, despite having this genotype so all the other genotypes she has are essentially predisposing her to to having higher odds of male pattern hair loss. Well, I guess that makes sense, right? Because Europeans, for Europeans, 1.59 is actually kind of like a low score. Europeans typically would score like five, like like 2.5 instead instead of 1.5. So it makes sense. It's kind of a low score for her. I didn't remark on this when I first uh, talked about it, but it is kind of a low score for Europeans. Um, no risk for Kahneman syndrome. Uh, no risk variance, no protective variance from HIV, but also no predisposition, no predisposing variance. To and now we get to the good stuff. Now we get to the HLA gene panel. So for the HLA gene panel, she's scoring lower odds of autoimmune disease, which is really good to see. But despite her scoring lower odds of autoimmune disease, she's she's got a lot of percentages for intermediate and even higher odds of autoimmune disease. Seventeen percent for highest is very high. So let's go over these uh, genotypes and find out what is there anything to worry about. So she's got uh, genotypes for average and lower odds of psoriasis, which in this case, average means lower, which is really good to see. Uh, no reduced protection from Epstein-Barr vi virus infection. No reduced protection is probably no reduced protection, which means no reduced protection. So what does that mean, no reduced protection? I'm so, I'm so confused. Let's, let's look that up, actually. So, uh, yeah, I looked it up in the code, and it is good. It is a good genotype. That's crazy. I, the, hey, man, I have to, like, really make it more easy to understand what, what these mean. I have to write, like, good or bad before each of the genotypes because it's so difficult to understand, even for me. I, I forgot what it means. Okay, some of them. Some of them are e bad, easy, like, bad to... Hard to, re to read, hard to understand. Okay, here she's got um, GT. Likely to carry one of the risk alleles, possible risk for... Wow, okay, so that's bad. That's really bad. That's a really bad uh, genotype in the HLA-B. I remember that in the HLA-B, these, these heterozygous genotypes are really bad. So this really contributed to the to the highest uh, odds of autoimmune disorder and intermediate odds. It's really interesting that despite having this genotype right here, she's still scoring lower lowest odds for autoimmune disease. Uh, everything else must be really good. She doesn't have carmazepine carmi sensitivity. That's really good. 
Uh, high odds for the lupus, that's really bad. Lower odds for autoimmune disease, that's really good. Uh, that's really good. That's that's actually a really good genotype. So um, this also really contributed in a, in a very good way to the lower odds of, of autoimmune disease. That's really bad. But uh, that's also kind of bad, but not that big of a deal. That's good. That's um, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And that's good. So overall, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of really good genotypes here. The biggest the genotype that's that's there was the biggest contribution for good is probably this one. But also, but also, I feel like. Um, all the multiple sclerosis genotypes, like the multiple sclerosis, this one and this one and this one and this one, the multiple sclerosis genotypes, they, they're all, uh, they all played a very big contribution, but this one played a very big contribution as well. So there's a lot of really good genotypes here that, uh, that contributed to the lower odds of autoimmune disorder. Uh, but there is also this one genotype right here, which probably is the reason for the 17.2%. Uh, highest odds of autoimmune disease, but it's a heterozygous gene type, so it's not it's not even that bad. It could be worse. And um, there is another HLA-B genotype that is not in this file. It looks like there, if it was in this file, it would probably make the situation a lot worse. Um, but it looks like it wasn't in this file. Okay. But like, if you look, if you this genotype, if you have this genotype in, in your in your file, and uh, that's that's the genotype you got you most likely will score something that's very different from this. You most likely will score highest or intermediate odds of autoimmune disease because this is a very high impact genotype. But it looks like despite having this, this individual is still scoring quite good for the HLA gene panel. Uh, so lower odds of autoimmune disorder. For MTRR gene, looks like she's got um, three risk alleles for uh, disorders of intracellular colloid metabolism. Three out of ten, pretty good stuff. And for CBS gene panel, looks looks like she's got lowest plasma homocysteine levels, and she also has. Um, um, okay, I was debating. I was I wasn't sure in the MTHFR gene panel. Let's go. Let's go back to the MTHFR gene panel, and uh, we saw these genotypes. Uh, this genotype is this one for highest odds of uh, neural tip defects. I wasn't sure if that contributed to the C. Uh, to the homocysteine panel, but now I think I think it doesn't. I think it doesn't now because if it did, uh, then the homocysteine panel, then the homocysteine panel wouldn't be lo looking the way it does right now, uh, because homocysteine panel wouldn't be forty-seven percent for lower levels of homocysteine. It would be very different. So it looks like the only genotype from the eight MTHFR MTHFR panel that contributed to, to the homocysteine panel is this one which leads to the normal homocysteine levels uh, good, slightly lower than average odds for variety of illnesses from autism to coronary heart disease. So it looks like the only genotype from the MHHFR panel that contributed to the homocysteine panel is this one. Because I, when I was adding this to my code, when I was adding this to my program, that was like a couple of weeks ago. You have to remember that when I was coding this, it was like literally like three or four weeks ago. And I don't remember when I was, uh, when I was doing this coding and research. Um, I don't even remember what I, when I was doing like four weeks ago. So... I have to like re relearn all this stuff now that I, when I cover it in my videos, but, um, anyway, let's go back to the homocysteine panel. So here, uh, she's scoring lower homocysteine levels, which is really good. Lower odds for like, it's, it's so much actually. Uh, I don't even want to make like a cancers. I don't even want to make like a polygenic risk for cancers because homocysteine levels pretty much covers risks for a variety of cancers and stuff like that. Um, it's really like such a profound, it has such a profound impact on your health. So it looks like she has a predisposition to lower homocysteine levels. Really good to see for, for muscular dystrophy, my is no risk clearance for any of that. And she has one risk clearance for adrenal leukodystrophy. dystrophy, but you already know what my stance on that is. I feel like that's a missed call. And for colorblindness panel, no risk clearance for colorblindness. Really good to see for FTO gene panel. For FTO gene panel, looks like she has a predisposition to lower or intermediate odds of obesity. Really good to see based on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Based on eight SNPs, she has an intermediate or lower odds of obesity. For syncope panel, based on five SNPs, she has an average odds for syncope. 
for bio trades panel looks like we're gonna find some inter interesting information here she has one copy of the hunter gatherer and one copy of the farmer variant and cltcl1 which is the intermediate ability to process carbs and sugars the farmer leo c i'm not sure why i wrote that there i have to you know what I, you know what i have to do i have to work on making this much more easy to understand because i feel like i feel like it might be difficult some of the stuff is difficult to read even for me i have to i have to revert to my code and uh uh, read into my code to understand like like right now it, it's so embarrassing i'm recording a video and i had to actually look it up in my code to understand what it means <laughs> yeah that's that's yikes that's a yikes but i'll fix it don't worry i'll fix it and um it will be fixed all, all of this will be fixed i'll make it i'll make it much more presentable okay and uh for blood group we're gonna skip all that for blood group she's scoring blood type b most likely blood type b that's a very uncommon blood type most likely pe most people have blood type o that's the most common blood type by far in the world but her blood type looks like blood type b uh kind of unusual kind of atypical but um it looks like her blood type is blood type b well thanks for watching my video until the very end um i do i do skip uh, over a lot of the stuff here also my plan right now is to like uh, you see, you see, it's kind of a clustered. The HLA gene panel right now is kind of looking like a cluster. I'm trying to make a separate, like a like a separate page for the HLA gene panel, where you could click on it and you can explore all the relevant variations for HLA gene and their contributions to various diseases and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, the HLA gene is actually separated into it's a bunch of different smaller genes that are all located right next to each other, that all contribute slightly to different to different traits actually. It's kind of like um, DRD2 and DRD4, but they're even they're even more tightly clustered together than these two genes. So HLA genes are very very tightly clustered together, and I'm trying to make them make a separate page for the HLA genes, and um, you're probably gonna see that in the next update. So it's gonna be all this clustered stuff that's gonna be fixed. You're gonna see a major update when it comes to the HLA gene very soon. So don't don't worry. When I say when you when you see stuff like that, it's gonna change really soon. It's gonna look a lot better. Um, well, thanks for watching. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe in in case you enjoy my video, enjoy my content, and um, um, make sure you check out the description of the video. In the description, you will find the links to my Patreon, where you can suggest me videos about some ancient samples you want me to cover. Uh, you can also check out my uh, pay hip where, where you can purchase the DNA files from DNA samples that I covered. Also, you can check out um, the links to buy Trade Predictor, which will be in the description of the video, which is the software that I use to generate these trade, rep trade reports for the samples that I cover. Also, in the description of the video, you can find the uh, link to buy a trade report for $4 from me. Where you essentially just send me your DNA file and I'll send you back back a report that looks like this. And that only costs four dollars. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for watching my video until the very end. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And 